Okay, good morning, everyone. Everyone got their coffee? I'm having mine. It's kind of it's interesting getting the slot after the conference party, so I'll try and keep everyone awake. So we'll start off by asking some questions just to see if everyone is awake. Here's a statement. A software system can best be designed if the testing is interlaced with the design instead of being used after the design. Sounds a bit like TDD to me. How do we think said that and when did they say that? Anyone willing to volunteer a decade? Was it the 90s? Was this Kent Back, Ward Cunningham? Someone else? Any decades? 60s? 50s, yeah, going back. This was the 60s. This was a guy called Alan J. Perlis back in 1968. So we kind of worked out TDD in 68. Anybody know who Alan J. Perlis is? Very little noise coming back. Anyone heard of the Turing Awards? Yeah, he's the first recipient of the Turing Awards. We've got great memory of our industry, don't we? It's kind of crazy, this sort of stuff going back. I think we end up doing some kind of crazy things, and I love to collect photographs off the internet. Like, maybe, is this how we do engineering? <laughs> do we remember our history? This is from Russia. Russia gets no monopoly on this. Let's look at my own country. That's supposed to be a fuse. You start to, start to see this crazy stuff that's out there. I kind of wonder, how do we build software? The funny thing is, I've seen a lot of software that's kind of badly done. Now, let's look at something that's a bit neater, a bit cleaner, but from the other side of the world, Australia. Nah, it seems to be a bit of a global phenomenon. We end up doing these crazy things with our software. This kind of went around last year. Is this, is this the sort of core of our industry? Is this what we do? Quite possibly. Now, if I start finding this interesting, so here's some advertisements, Mercedes-Benz talking about their cars, and they're talking here about how one of their cars has 1.7 million lines of code in a Raptor fighter, but they have 6.5 million lines of code in their car. Way more software in the car than there is in the most advanced fighter aircraft in the world today. This is kind of interesting. That's a lot, a lot of software. It kind of goes further than this. They even brag about it in their advertisements, where they're talking about 50 times more code than a fighter, or 250 times more code than the space shuttle. So, did this marketing department understand anything about code? 250 times what was in the space shuttle? Yeah, and a few of those went wrong as well. We're going to be driving around in these things, and it's kind of scary. I've seen various figures on how much code is in the latest Teslas. At the low end, I've heard of 220 million lines of code, and the high end, 350 million lines of code. We're trusting our lives to our software. Are we really a disciplined engineering profession that the world is going to be based on us going forward? I think it's kind of interesting. I want to explore this question. But to put some stuff in context, I kind of like to think about how many generations of programmers do we have? Our industry hasn't been around that long in many ways. Like anybody here say they're a second generation programmer? Mother or father programmed? Any third generation programmers? Not a lot, really. And you sort of think of other disciplines where you hand these down through generations, we get much better at stuff with time. So we're kind of young, we're kind of working it out. So I was involved in a number of standards in the 1990s, building software, trying to do it better. So ISO 9001, 27001. So these are kind of interesting ways. We tried to write better software. And what I find from this is we went from having crap to having well-documented crap. <laughs> software didn't get any better. Another way to look at this is we're kind of living in the era of software alchemy. We're making this up, a bit like physics of the 1600s. Like, 
Isaac Newton done some great work. He was also one of the most significant alchemists of the time, where alchemy is trying to turn lead into gold. We're kind of searching for these silver bullets, the kind of crazy things that we're doing. I want to explore the subject of engineering. And we hear a lot in our industry about, are we doing engineering? Are we doing science? Are we doing a craft? There's kind of interesting arguments on lots of sides. It's always kind of fascinated me sort of where we fit in this sort of spectrum. By background, I'm a computer scientist, computer science major at university. I spent a lot of time in the engineering department and seen other engineering disciplines. So I'm kind of like, how do we fit with this? So let's kind of go back a bit. So one of the confessions I can make is I was educated in Ireland by nuns, so the good old Catholic religion was beaten into me, including Latin. And you sort of go back to Latin is where we actually get to see some of the history of engineering. So the original term meaning sort of cleverness or to contrive or devise. There's definitely a bit of contriving and devising in our software. But the sort of first reference to engineering as a term comes back to sort of about the 1300s in old French. And it's to do with the military designing sort of people who designed uh, stuff that worked for a machine, like a catapult or some sort of weapon of war. And so engineering is kind of steeped in the military in many ways. Unfortunately, it's the kind of interesting thing of our history. Most sort of technological advancements are driven by war in the military quite often. We later, later got civil engineering as a term, and that was pretty much everything else that was in military at the time. So we kind of get this sort of evolving thing over time where we start off with the military and then become civil. But let's go to the font of all human knowledge, Wikipedia, and see what they've got to say about engineering. So the definition of engineering on Wikipedia is engineers must work within constraints. I think this is very true. I write Java most days. I feel very constrained. Now, these constraints can be all sorts of different ways. There could be available resources. That's definitely something. Is it physical? Is it imaginative? Is it technical limitations? Yeah, we are dealing with these limitations. One of the most important points for me about engineering is flexibility for future modifications and additions. This is so applicable to software. We are always having to modify and adopt software. Think about even if you're working on a greenfield project, this week, you're probably modifying code you wrote last week. And code you wrote six months ago was effectively written by someone else. So having code that's readable, understandable, easy to modify, easy to add to, is kind of key. And that's very much a core tenant of a lot of engineering. But there's other factors that need to go into what we're working on. So we've got to care about cost. We've got to care about marketability, productivity, but particularly safety. Safety is very strong in most engineering disciplines. I would argue it's actually quite strong in our discipline. We don't just practice it enough. So think of things like memory safety, concurrency safety. There's lots of practice in different ways. The safety for people in our teams and how we function. And when we understand these constraints and limitations, we can look at what we need to produce. So that's the kind of definition that doesn't sound like a million miles away from the things that we should be caring about. So what does a great scientist think of engineering versus science? So direct quote from Albert Einstein, scientists investigate that which already is, engineers create that that has never been, they create the future. Very much a lot of what we are doing is creating the future. Like Stephen Steele from Alan Kay, he talked about how you don't need to predict the future, you go ahead and invent it in some ways. So it's very much an interesting thing. So software engineering is a term. Where does this come from? Where does it all come back to? Well, it's exactly 50 years ago that software engineering was first used as a term. One of the first references is this paper, sort of going back to 1967. They talk about software engineering in this paper. Where it became popularized was this woman, Margaret Hamilton. She very much did great work to make software engineering become known as a concept, done some amazing things herself. So things that we have today, like priority scheduling, human in the loop, end-to-end -end testing, they all come from this great lady. She worked at NASA, worked on the lunar landings but also sort of ended up eventually running the software division at NASA. Was, she was director of engineering there for that and instilled some great engineering practices. 
I've been privileged enough to work with some people who worked in that department and how they approach software development is really interesting and how it does truly focus on engineering. So some of the history of this and where it goes forward. So going back again to 1968, so 49 years ago, there was a conference it was set up in Germany. It was run by NATO. This is a brilliant paper. I really recommend you read this if you get a chance after it. The great thing about conferences in those days is they recorded the proceedings of it. So all of the interesting bits are captured and minuted, and they're in this paper. So it's a beautiful read. But let me pull out some points from this conference, because uh, there were some really interesting things happening there and things said. So here's a little bit. The design process is an iterative one. Now, remember the context, 1968. Flowchart until you think you understand the problem. Write code until you realize you don't. Go back and redo the flowchart. Write some more code and iterate till you feel you have the correct solution. Iterative development described in the 60s. What went wrong when we went off and done waterfall? <laughs> Not showing the signs of learning. So, oh, I went the wrong way. So, is another one. Reliability really is a design issue. So we have to design these things in up front. I find it particularly interesting how the quality attributes are ignored. So performance, security, reliability, usability, all of these things is you can't add them after. It has to be part of the design process. We've got to do this. I like how they finish it with, if you don't do these things, you might as well give up. We try to add this on at the end, there's a lot we can learn from this. Oh, this is a great one. The good systems that are presently working were written by small groups. More than 20 programmers working on a project is usually disastrous. <laughs> I think that still holds true today in many cases. All right, another one on approach. Begin with skeletal coding. So rather than aiming at finished code, the first 46 coding steps should be aimed at exploring interfaces, size of critical modules, complexity, adequacy of those modules. Some critical items should be checked out. Bring the hard things to the front. I'll talk more about that later. And kind of one of the really great ones that was pulled out in this state, now consider this was the military. There was a lot of the Navy present there, a lot of the Air Force. And the Air Force made the point that to keep your wings as a pilot, you've got to fly a minimum number of hours per month. They were saying in the 60s that we should be having programmers and senior architects who are writing a minimum number of lines of code per month. We still see that debate going on. I think it is absolutely insane that people claim to be an architect or a lead in some ways and don't write code. Like use other professions to look at. If you were the chief surgeon in a hospital, you would still perform operations. You wouldn't go telling everybody else what to do and never practice yourself. Like we are a practice. We need to reinforce this by regular activity. This is a classic one I've seen a lot. So they're talking about how the programmers are working with their customers. So, so many people who design software referring to the users as they or them. It's the sort of them and us thing that's coming about. They talk about how most designers are, of the software are designing it for their own benefit, not for the benefit of the customers. I'd be really quite crude about this and say a lot of what I see in teams is technical masturbation. That's kind of what it is. People are doing stuff for their own gratification rather than for the customer. We need to be focused on what we're building and why we're building it. So there's some fascinating bits from this. Like, there's a lot of great people there. Alan J. Perlis, who I give that original quote from, was at that conference, and that was one of his pieces that was there. Another person who was there was Dijkstra. Since I'm in the Netherlands, it makes sense to even pick on some of what he's got to say. One of the papers I've read of his that I think is very interesting is he talked on the cruelty of really teaching computer science and what's involved in that. Dijkstra is a kind of interesting character. There's some brilliance in there, but he's a bit of an acquired taste in some ways. His opinions are very strong. But in this particular paper, he pulled out a couple of really interesting points that I think are worth exploring. One is this concept of radical novelty. 
and how he describes that software is so different from the things that we've done before, we don't really have a frame of reference. Right. As humans, we do really well by teaching with storytelling, analogy, metaphor. They're some of our main tools for communicating. Unfortunately, there's some things we try to communicate that there is not a metaphor or something we can use to help us in this. So Dijkstra talked about when you try to create these links, if the things that we're trying to deal with that's already familiar, if they're not the same, they become hopelessly inadequate. In fact, they're quite misleading in this. He moved on to give some really good examples. And he says, like, so if you go back further in time, what are other examples of this? So like relativity and quantum mechanics. If you've ever stood, understood those, they're very, very different from anything else. You can't put them in a sort of con common context. Other later examples is the atomic bomb or the contraceptive pill. We're talking about things that are so fundamentally different. The, the radical novelty is so high that it shakes the foundations of society. These are things that change governments, change religions, change ways of thinking about. And some of what we're doing now with the internet is on the same scale. The internet is changing the world in such a fundamental way, the same as some of these previous sorts of things. So you're saying, like, we've got to be aware, and also don't be afraid to sort of try to explain the difficult stuff and actually just hunker down and go for it, because these, some of these things are difficult, and we have to put the effort in. He talked about, and then how do we approach this? What are the two major things we need to do when we approach stuff? Well, one of them is the divide and rule he talked about, sort of decomposition. We need to learn how to decompose things at an unprecedented scale that we've just never had to do it before. So you take the example of the Tesla, hundreds of millions of lines of software that's inside there. How do you understand that? How do you reason about that? It has to have decomposition on an unprecedented scale to have any idea what's going on. So these are skills that we need to be practicing on a sort of weekly or even daily basis. How do we decompose problems? How do we abstract problems? And not the poor form of abstraction, not the law of leaky abstractions that we talk about from Joel Spolsky, but real abstraction, particularly like in the mathematical context. He then pointed out as well that software has this really interesting facet to it is that when we make a change to it, the amplification of those changes is, again, totally unprecedented. It's drastic. We can change one bit and a complete software system fails. It can be a catastrophic failure by just getting one bit wrong. Now, there's things we can do to isolate and constrain that, but we have to actively think about it. We can't just be sort of lax or slapdash about this because the implications are just so significant to getting it wrong. Most other things that we do as humans don't have that sort of scale that we can make those sort of things go wrong. So that's a kind of interesting history of engineering, of science, and some of the things that there's some things to think about in there. I kind of recommend go back and read some of the works of our history of our subject. It's great. But there's kind of an interesting other side to this. So I mentioned that I'm a computer science major by background. My minor, when I was at university, was behavioral psychology. And it's a fascinating subject to look into because humans are really key to how we all work, how we interact in this, and sort of being aware of this. But one of the things you'll learn from any sort of studies of psychology is that we are very much a product of our own experiences. So the experiences we have in life very much makes us who we are in many ways. So I want to kind of explore that as a subject. So if we look at engineering as a history, how do we engineer ourselves? How can we change how we approach our own ways of looking at this? So, to put this in some context, I find an uncomfortable truth on many projects and companies I've dealt with in my history, and other people I've talked to have seen this very similar thing, that very often the people who make significant change and significant progress, particularly on software projects, is usually a very small number. It's usually one or a very small group of people often working outside the standard process. They're the people who often get stuff done. And so you kind of think, why is that? What's different about them? What's unique about them? And I want to sort of pull out some of what I have observed in myself and others, sort of looking at some of these individuals and what they do and how they approach things. But if we look at learning as a way of approaching something, I want to sort of break this down into three parts. 
What should we learn as individuals if we want to be good engineers? Where can we go about learning that? Which is also interesting. And then how do we go about the learning process itself? So break this down into the three categories. So what should we learn? I kind of argue up front that things like algorithms and data structures are fundamental to what we do. Uh, I've been programming since the 1980s, and I find that things that I learned back in the 1980s about good choice of algorithms, good choice of data structures, still are valuable to me today. You can go back and you can read the works of Knuth, and it is still valuable today. Also in history, I've learned things like I knew WebLogic 6.4 really, really well at one stage. Is that any good to me at all today? You sort of think, I'm a big fan of The Simpsons, and sort of think of Homer. He talks about everything you learn. When you learn something new, something else gets pushed out that's important. I think when I spent a long time learning WebLogic 6.4, it was not good. <laughs> something important went at that stage. So, these algorithms, these data structures, they're not something you'll use every single day, but they're kind of fundamental building blocks to how we approach stuff. There's a lot to be learned from that, just picking the right data structures for a relationship. Knowing and having an awareness of different algorithms is really good in influencing how you write your own code. This is kind of just one of the building blocks. I think another really strong one is design fundamentals. All right. When I'm talking about design fundamentals, I'm talking about understanding coupling, cohesion, separation of concerns, single responsibility principle. A lot of people can sort of talk about these things, they can mention them, but if you look at their code, it doesn't truly represent it. Like, what are you practicing every day? So people talk about coupling. I'll give a simple example. You call a method or a function and you go to pass something in. So say, for example, you had a customer and you just want to have the customer identity, their ID, whatever that happens to be. Do you pass in the whole customer object? Now you're coupled to the customer. Or do you pass in just the identity? Now you're only coupled to that. These little things every day start to make a difference in your design. We've got to be practicing them so we're getting good at them and they'll stay with you at all times. Single responsibility really helps with understanding just what something does. It makes it easier to name, to talk about, all of these sort of things. And underlying a lot of this is programming paradigms. Object orientation, procedural. But we find that a lot of people are OO programmers, they may be procedural programmers. Functional is kind of taking off in a big way. But there's also things like set theory, logic programming, all sorts of different ways of looking at problem spaces. It really helps your approach to something. I wrote a lot of prologue at one stage in my life. I am incredibly comfortable now with recursion. And you can solve problems in interesting ways if you've practiced with that. Functional techniques are wonderful to bring even if you're an object-oriented programmer or a procedural programmer. There's a lot to be learned from things like monotonic functions, pure functions, different ways of approaching stuff. We can learn from these ideas. So to have that diversity of input is really important. If you're kind of one track, I'm an OO programmer and that's all I do, or I'm a procedural programmer, or I'm a functional programmer, and you don't look at the other ways, you've limited your toolbox. There's a lot of ways we can stimulate our brains and give us different ways of thinking. This also helps with things like decomposition and, abst and abstraction. Dijkstra talked about how key this is. Like, if we need to be able to reason about our problem spaces, we got to get good at decomposition. Is it behavioral decomposition? Is it functional? Is it data? Whatever. There's lots of different ways we can decompose problems, but we need to be thinking about them, understanding them, going and reading about them, and learning about these sorts of things, not learning about the latest sort of JavaScript framework or the latest Java framework, whatever it happens to be. Let's face it, if you learn a new JavaScript framework, it's probably out of date next week. It's like learning milk. So it's, it goes stale so quickly. Learn the things that matter. And under this, like, I keep finding this is very, very true. If there was one subject at school I wish I paid more attention to, and that's mathematics. I would challenge anybody who says mathematics is not important that they're a person that doesn't truly understand mathematics. It is so fundamental to how everything works. But also, really importantly, is not just understanding it, it's understanding how to apply it. 
I work a lot in the performance space, so I'm very familiar with things like queuing theory and Little's law and universal scalability law and all those sorts of things. But when you truly understand some of the mathematics behind that, you start spotting it in lots of places that it's not obvious. For example, Little's law we'll hear about, it turns up in networking theory called bandwidth delay product. It's actually the core of agile and lean manufacturing is all about Little's law. So understanding that mathematics is actually why those sort of things work. But we can't hide from some of this stuff. I learned statistics at school. I found it deadly dull and boring. And then as an adult at one stage, I wrote a robot to play poker. I went back and revisited statistics. It was a wonderful subject, rich and interesting. Now when I'm approaching like big data problems, I've got the mathematics behind me that really helps me understand this. But what really stands out in this is we're needing to go parallel in the future. We're not going to get faster single cores, and mathematics is the key to that. So you've got to be able to look at a problem and make it commutative and associative. And you kind of think, oh, I remember that kind of a little bit from school. You might even sort of think, oh, yeah, it's about the ordering or the grouping. But spotting it and when to apply it all the time is things that really matter for making the scale up and making it clean and efficient. And kind of last in this area that I think is very important is we're moving into this world of distributed systems. It's kind of, it's here, it's concurrent, it's distributed. That means things are communicating with each other. We've got to really understand the fundamentals of communication, protocols of interaction, codecs, ways of working. So at a sort of basic level, understanding protocols is really, really important. There's great bodies of work in networking and other services from the past where we can look at this. The ITF is a great source of knowledge for a lot of this. Most people just get stuff talking together and don't understand the fundamentals of how communications work. And I'm kind of starring this subject because it so applies at other levels. It's how humans interact so drives our patterns as well. And if you sort of take from Conway's law, all software takes on the shape of the organization that built it. So organizations with good communication structures tend to have software with good communication structures. We kind of just we end up having really what we practice and how we approach things. We can't ignore this. And to kind of point out a sort of current meme that's going around at the moment is that we've got monoliths and we're going to go to microservices. And when you've got a monolith, and if the monolith is big and steamy and smelly, what's going to happen if you break it up into microservices? What happens to anything that's smelly when you increase the surface area of it? It smells a lot more. You've got to get the fundamentals right before adding even more complexity and surface area to stuff. You gotta keep practicing these. So where can we learn? Well, kind of the thing that's really front and center is personal practice. To get great at anything, you've gotta practice it. You've gotta put your 10,000 hours in. If anybody's ever learned music, learned a sport, learned something that requires real dedication, they'll understand what I mean by this. We've got to put the practice in. So a lot of the previous things I'm talking about, the decomposition, the data structures, the paradigms, all that sort of stuff, unless you're practicing it on a daily level, practicing it right, you won't get better. Now, I have a background in sports, and one of the things my coaches drilled into me whenever I was young, and drilled this in really, really hard, is when you are practicing over and over again, if you practice bad habits, they become instinctual. You have to practice good habits. So when you find yourself applying the design patterns, do you apply them correctly with good discipline? Because if you don't, you're now making them reflexive to do them in a bad way. So we've got to think and catch yourself almost every day doing the right things so that you're drilling. When you drill things over and over again, they become the way you act under pressure. And we do all get under pressure at times. So make sure your personal practice is correct. Do not be practicing the bad ways over and over again because that will then become instinctual. We need to learn from people. And so the other people that we work with and interact with, the teams we join, are so influential to how we develop and how we evolve as people. Now, some of us get lucky and we get sort of great teams to work with and great people to work with, but we gotta try and influence that in some ways. I would give a call out to the industry as a whole. If you're working with bad teams and bad people, go work somewhere else. There is enough great work out there that you can go find good organizations to work with. Don't work with organizations that just do bad things. 
it's one of the nice things about our industry is we have the choice, so go and exercise that choice. And to kind of pull it out even further, if you're a manager or someone who runs a team, if you have a problem person in the team, try to fix them or remove them. Don't let the team be destroyed by bad behavior. People who behave really badly can damage a team and damage everybody else in that team so easy. So we can't always get the ideal teams. We can't always get the ideal people. How do we compensate for some of that? Well, there's great papers. There's great documentation of the history of our subject out there. We don't read enough of it. Like I've referenced a few papers in this so far. I'll talk about a few more things as we go on. But there's a great world of stuff out there. Personally, I never read as much of the papers until about 10 years ago. And I worked with some people who helped me understand that. So some of those people who worked in NASA, who I have had the pleasure of working with, that's one of the things they taught me, is to read research papers. There's a lot to be learned and gleaned from that. There's a lot of great history in our subject. But not just the research papers, reading other codes. Stephen King, the author, was once asked, how do you become a great writer? His response was, first you must read a lot and become a great reader. That is so true with code as well. You've got to read other people's code to learn from it. And so we should be writing code to be read. It's like the modifications for future adaptations is so key as an engineering discipline. And we've got to also read lots of it. Our industry doing a lot of stuff proprietary has stifled this to an extent. We should be able to study other great works, and this should be a common thing. Open source is helping that. Most other professions, the great work gets studied. We're not doing that enough. Like, if you want to become a great musician, go watch other great musicians. Ideally, jam with them, play with them. You want to become great at sport, you go play a sport with the great people. You don't do it on your own. You've got to interact with them, and you've got to observe what they do, because humans are great mimics. We're great at mimicking other things, so let's go read some good stuff. Some great examples out there. So one of the people I think moved the industry forward in some nice ways is John Carmack, ID Software. A lot of his software for the games engines of Quake and Doom has now been open sourced. You think C is an ugly language? Go read his C code. It's not at all. Like, we can blame languages for lots of things, but more often it's the person rather than the language. You can have great, really nice, high quality code written in almost any language if the author cares enough and develops it in the right way. When we go to learn on projects, we go enter a project, there's so much we don't know. This is something we just have to accept, is we are doing lots of new things, there's lots we don't know. What's one of the most important things you can do on a project? Bring the hard, unknown stuff up the front. Do the hard stuff first, it gives you the maximum amount of time to get to understand, to do the research, to fix what you need to fix, to move forward. It really helps you, so it's simple little things. Our instinct is, we'll walk away from the hard stuff, we'll leave it to later, maybe it'll go away. Like we talk about doing things at the last responsible moment, that gets misunderstood. You start practicing the hard stuff up front so you've got plenty of chance to get it right. And we're in this world now where we've got the internet. There's so much online resources that we can go and study for this, we can go and learn from. The kind of really interesting thing is, no longer is recall a useful skill. I remember sort of doing job interviews sort of in the early 90s and people were asking you to recall facts all of the time. It's a skill that's almost irrelevant now because we just go look it up, we just Google for it. The real skill is understanding what is good that's out there in this vast sea of information. So when we're going back to the copying and pasting of Stack Overflow, what do we copy and paste? What do we look at? And how do we decide what is right? But a lot of that is science, and science will teach us how to do those things better. So let's look at how we learn. Kind of first and foremost on this is automate all boring, repetitive tasks. If you don't, you won't have the time to do all of the other things you need to do. Time is the most precious resource we all have in our personal lives and on our projects in every way. And the way we get more time is we automate everything. Like, who here does not have a CI build these days? Who's really proud that their CI is good? <laughs> this kind of starts to get interesting. So we're kind of becoming aware that things like continuous integration is important. 
is your commit build happening in under three minutes? Is your acceptance build completing in under 20 minutes? If not, the behaviors of your team will change quite significantly. So focusing on some of those important things, having that great CI environment, is one of the things I was most proud of at LMAX is we had a great continuous integration environment. And at times, it wasn't as good as we ultimately would like it. But having tens of thousands of tests meant we just had a quality of our code base that is very rare normally. But you have to invest in it. You have to have that effort put in to get it right. When we've done that, it then frees us up to look at other things. And actually, one of the things with that is focusing on the feedback cycles. So when you go to learn anything, you want to shorten the distance as much as possible between needing an answer and getting that sort of feedback. So you're doing experiments, you're doing whatever it happens to be. How do you make those feedback cycles as short as possible? This is why we try to get CI to run quickly. We get the answer quickly. I've worked in a lot of startups, and it's amazing how people go off in all sorts of crazy directions. There's lots of stuff you don't know. I ask oh, was a very simple question is, how can you find out the answer for that for the minimum investment? Because everything is an investment. How do you find that answer out for the minimum investment in time, money, people, whatever it happens to be? And we do a lot of this by experimentation. So engineering is an interesting discipline. It's underpinned by science in many ways. And one of the greatest things we have about science is a scientific method. Part of that is we have to do lots of experiments. And experiments are the way we can reason about the things that we deal with. So we've got to get good at them. We've got to put together good quality experiments. We've got to have the hypothesis we're being testing. And then get good at measuring. So make sure we're measuring the things and measuring the right sort of things, and not just being misled. Feynman talked about applying scientific honesty. So you can have science, but if you don't apply it correctly, I'm not trying to make this point a number of times, like mathematics is good, but you've got to get good at applying it. Engineering is good, but you've got to get good at applying it. Science is good, but you've got to get good at applying it. Don't deceive yourself. So you do an experiment, you go to measure, you get some results. Don't try to fit the results to what you want the answer to be. You've got to find the model that is really what the data is telling you and sort of working through that. We're very easy to deceive. It's something all of us have as a weakness is we'll go into something with a preconception, with a bias, with whatever it is. We've got to let the data take us away from our biases if we can. Don't try to pull it back the other way. But that's just down to admitting that to ourselves and dealing with it. And probably the most important point I have on this, so if there's one thing you can do to change your working practices going forward, is what I call revisit and refine. We'll do lots of interesting things, and one of the things that behavioral psychology and behavioral science teach us is a bit about how the human brain works. So if you go to do something, you'll fill up your short-term memory with the task that you're working on. When you go to review what you've just done, is you're often just replaying out of your short-term memory. So for the CPU nerds in the room, this is your cache. This is what your, your working set you're, you're dealing with. So let's make a simple example. I'm going to write a really important email that needs to go out to a whole company. I write the email, and I proofread it straight afterwards. You will have lots of mistakes in it that you don't see because you will be using what's in your memory, what your intent was, not what you actually did. So what should you do is, would you set it aside? You go off and you do something else, and you come back later and then you revisit it and you review again. You will spot things that you didn't see if you just reviewed it straight away. There's lots of great examples of this, and particularly with code. Like when we come to papers, Tony Hoare, another one of the Turing Award winners who done CSP and other things, he used to have multiple papers going at any given point in time, and he didn't just do a paper, finish it, and publish it. He let them have a duration, he let them back in where you let them sort of gestate for a while. So you'd do it, you'd leave it aside, go and do something else, come back, review it, refine it. Whenever he'd done that a few times and he was happy, there was not too many more issues with it, then he would publish. I've been practicing this with my own code and I found it has been one of the biggest differences to the quality of my code is I write something, it's not complete. It's reached a point where I'm happy with it for now, I'll move on, I'll do another task. I plan in time to come back Read, review, and refine it. So you revisit and you refine. You find mistakes. You find more elegant ways of dealing with something. You can find a way of making that code cleaner. You improve it and you move on. 
and you just keep this pipeline going all of the time, where you're doing multiple things in a pipeline and you just come back to them again, it makes a huge difference to improving quality and how you work. And to go back to the kind of finish off this section with the, one of the true tenets of engineering, I'm going to take a thing from Margaret Hamilton and how she approached things. So whenever the lunar lander started having issues, and one of the things that she had designed that saved that was priority scheduling. And she did think, like, things will go wrong. By our nature, we start thinking very negatively about it. I liked how she looked at it positively. So things went wrong. The positive assertion to how the brain works is she thought, what must I preserve, not what can go wrong? Subtle kind of differences, but sort of thinking about what can go wrong starts to become really important. So here's a call out for another paper. This is a paper that talks about production outages in some uh, data intensive applications and what were the causes of those. Now, there's a sort of rich seam of different causes inside there, but a really strong theme through this was ignored errors. Like most of the production outages that they're find could have been caught by unit test. There was errors that had empty, to -to, uh, empty catch blocks and error handlers, ignored error codes returned from functions. There's a large percentage of these things that had a catch block for an exception with the to-do inside must fix before production. This is not professional. It's a bit like the unit testing thing. It's like we've now reached the point where a lot of people don't test their code properly, don't do CI. To me, this is like surgery when surgeons used to argue about how they should wash their hands. There is a hygiene factor to this. There's a level of professionalism that it is irresponsible to be just hacking code and throwing it out now. And we will end up getting pulled up on this as an industry. We gotta get better, we've gotta get cleaner on this. So, kinda, let's look at this in closing. What are some things that you need to think about? I like this concept of thinking about lines of code spent. There's only so much we can retain in our brains at any point in time. Some evidence suggests that if you're working on a system, if it gets more than about 10,000 lines of code for what you're responsible, it's difficult to make changes, it's difficult to understand the implications of that. So keeping it small and working out how do we decompose at an interesting level. That goes kind of further with so John Carmack, who I mentioned earlier, who done Quake and Doom, he talked about how removing lines of code is a good thing, but removing state is even better. I find one of the ways to measure projects and get genuine improvements, there's lots of ways you can measure stuff and people game a system. One of the things I've found is very successful is measuring lines of code deleted and measuring nothing else. How it really makes an imp uh, improvement to a system, makes it smaller, cleaner. It also gets ruthless about cutting out features that just aren't paying for themselves. Same thing can be said for state. Minimize this stuff, it makes it much easier to understand about it. It's things like other engineering disciplines have learned this. Like in aircraft, the perfect aircraft or spacecraft is the one in which there's nothing left you can take off it. Everything is there, everything has a purpose, and everything's clearly adding value. If something is costing more than the value that it's returning, it is not economic in the software, it shouldn't be there. And so, Everything does have a cost, but also everything should have a benefit, and we've got to get those things weighed up together. So, kind of thinking about this, don't feel bad. We are kind of living in this era of software alchemy. We're working this out. We're sort of, we're not totally building on the shoulders of giants yet. So we're not like physics where everybody knows who Newton, Einstein, Dirac, Feynman, all those people are. Like we barely even know our Turing Award winners, which seems to be a common thing. And by the way, we lost another great one on Monday with Thwacker, who's one of the few from uh, Palo Alto has gone. But let us learn from some of this. But the kind of interesting thing is, what we do is really cool. It's really nice in many ways. It's a, it's a job that we're almost paid to play. And we're shaping the future, and it's really great. So on that, I'll finish up and thank you very much.